just while you watch me comedically trying to set up the tripod I'll just let you know that this secrets has been split into three separate ones which will be published a day day and a half apart just due to the problems of uploading to YouTube from my camper van hello everybody John here and today on this very windswept day I'm going to do a secrets of the XK8 from inside the car and this is another one that's been a sort of cumulative by popular request over more than a year and that is a little bit on the secrets of the gearbox of the XK8. This particular episode comes with a, a preface that says I have an extraordinarily early 1996 XK8 and this car has the earliest gearbox whilst most of what we're going to discuss applies to all of the gearboxes that this car has had um, you just have to bear in mind I can only be specific about the car that I own note the lack of a rear high level light noting just how early in production this car is. Okay, let's go for a little ride and discuss some of the secrets of the XK8 gearbox. And um, first thing to note is I've just started the car up and it will only start in P for park or N for neutral and it's electronically barred from starting in any of the other gear positions and one of the things that uh, people like to discuss it, with all automatic cars is what would happen if you tried to put it into reverse whilst going forward at 100 miles an hour and all this sort of thing absolutely nothing so let's just dispel that one which is just a uh, YouTube clickbait. Um, like almost all gearboxes, um, there is an electronic def um, defeating system, which means if you put the car into reverse at any speed over, I think it's five miles an hour, don't quote me, but basically walking pace, then um, it won't actually mechanically do anything. You move the gear selector, but it goes, nah, I'm not going to move anything. I'm not going to move any anything inside the gearbox. So nothing happens whatsoever. Essentially, it just stays in drive or goes to neutral, depending on circumstances. So let's get out on the road and have a chat. So when these cars came out, there really was only one gearbox. The car has never been offered with a manual gearbox, although there are a couple of conversions out there that people have done um, to a greater and lesser extent of success. And that gearbox is the ZF 5HP24. The XK8 was not alone in being fitted with this gearbox. It's essentially the same box that's fitted to the BMW M5 of the same era. With the introduction of the XKR, the supercharged car, uh, 18 months later, we got another gearbox, which was the six-speed gearbox and that one came from Mercedes's stable and the function is very much the same uh, although the gearboxes are different the way that they work the way that they look and feel to use has been made very similar so most of what I'm going to share with you will apply equally to the Mercedes box
both boxes have a good reputation. Both have a couple of, sort of known faults or foibles, but what gearbox or engine doesn't? If we wanted to characterize the differences between the two, strengths and weaknesses, then you would say the earlier box, the one I'm driving, the five speed, uh, is by most believed to have smoother changes. The Mercedes box has slightly stronger internals and that's why it was used for the supercharged cars initially. Plus of course the th sixth gear and the sixth gear does give you a little bit of a performance edge in that you can be in the right gear more of the time. But when mated to an engine with a legendarily flat torque curve, i.e. 80% of available torque is deliverable across 90% of the rev range, um, that's kind of a moot point. It's kind of a technicality, the extra gears. Um, but do seem to be able to get a fraction more fuel economy out of a six speed than possibly out of a five speed. But either box, good. Um, the five speed like this can be prone to blowing uh, its drum. I think it's the B drum internally. Uh, it's just a design fault that means pressure over a long period of time tends to fatigue part of the drum uh, an edge breaks away and a seal starts to go and it's just one of them things if you've got one of these boxes and it's over maybe 90,000 miles and it's been used strongly spiritedly then it, it can be the case that you to end up having a rebuild but if you do that, then you replace the B drum with the BMW equivalent part, um, an upgrade that was put in later by BMW for their 5 Series, and that fault will never return. So after that, you're kind of bulletproof. In both cases, they're allegedly sealed for life gearboxes. Pay no attention to that whatsoever. They're long life gearboxes with bad access for filling and removing the oil. But the sumps contain oil filters, uh, they have got uh, drain plugs, they have got filler plugs, they're just not convenient. So you should basically look at any car that's in the 70s and 80,000 mile range, and if you're not aware that it's had its oil changed, transmission oil, or its filter changed in the transmission then it is worth getting that done. Can be done at home but far far easier if you've got the ability to put the car over a pit or on a lift something that's going to give you good access. As an enthusiastic amateur, you'll be completely fine doing it yourself if you have got access. The one thing to be aware of is you can get halfway through the job and the torque bolts which hold the sump on, this is the sump of the gearbox, uh, the oil pan, let's call it from now on, um, can snap shear off. And there are other bolts available which are stronger I think they start off as T27s and you can replace them with a T30 headed um, bolt. You can shear one of those off which gives you a longer job and again can make you wish if you're not that way inclined that you've given the job to a garage to do. So let's put all that aside. These are essentially very good gearboxes. They work well, they last well, and the few foibles and faults they have are well known. There's not really too many unknown faults. 